rise to declare recesses of the subcommittee at any time. Welcome to this morning's, this afternoon's hearing on maintaining judicial independence and the rule of law, examining the causes and consequences of court capture. Before we begin, I would like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of our hearing today. If you would like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. This hearing has been rescheduled many times, and I thank my colleagues for their patience as we've worked to find a date, and I thank our witnesses for their flexibility. The issue of the politicization of our cherished court system is a matter of great importance to me, and I'm sure this sentiment is echoed by many of my colleagues here today. I don't need to tell you that this hearing has taken on new weight given the events of the past week. The loss of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is something we all feel acutely. She was inspirational, not just as a way paver and role model for generations of lawyers here and around the world. She fought to protect so many of the rights that shape our lives as citizens of this nation. We are all better off in some small way because she touched, she touched our lives. We know her as someone who started her career fighting for women's equality. And we know her as someone who had a deep, heartfelt commitment to our Constitution. This is a personal loss to all of us. No one can ever replace her, but we must honor her legacy by continuing to fight for the rights she championed her entire career and by protecting the institution that she loved. What made Justice, what made Justice Ginsburg so beloved was her commitment to justice. She wasn't a rubber stamp for anyone, not for a president, not for a political party, not for an ideo ideological society or organization, and certainly not for any corporate interests. In an era when our Constitution is under attack and our fundamental rights hang in the balance, the sanctity of the third branch is essential to preserving our fragile democracy. An independent and accountable court system is essential to a free and fair democratic society. Without an accountable and, inde and independent judiciary, the fundamental promise that all of us are equal in the eyes of the law becomes a lie. And if the American people believe that justice is no longer equal, our judges lose a principal source of their authority, public faith in their integrity. Unlike the other branches of government, few re responsibilities of the judiciary are explicitly laid out in the Constitution. The reason we entrust judges with so much authority today is because we trust them to wield that authority independently of politics, political ideology, and personal connections. Judges should not serve presidents, parties, or political movements. They should not be seen as compromised by special interests and dark money. Justice judges should serve the cause of justice. Unfortunately, over the past years, we've seen the rushed appointment of former political operatives to judgeships, a political and ideological organization given undue weight in federal judicial nominations, and tens of millions of dollars spent by political and ideological organizations on federal nominations. We have also seen the president repeatedly attack federal judges in an attempt to intimidate the courts into doing what he says. We've also seen little movement by the judiciary to protect its integrity against these assaults on the rule of law. Somehow, 
the Supreme Court still refuses to adopt a code of ethics. Somehow, the Judicial Conference is unable to advise lower court judges that membership in groups dedicated to reshaping the judiciary is in incompatible with their ethical obligations. Somehow, the Supreme Court still uses its shadow docket to make life or death decisions via unsigned, unexplained orders issued in the dead of night. This should worry anyone who cares about the political neutrality and independence of our judicial system. In the last few years, we have also seen the Senate fail to live up to its constitutional obligation to dispassionately consider each and every one of the president of the President Trump's judicial nominees. Americans now see the Senate as a rushed rubber stamp, and many of us on this side of the Capitol are forced to agree. Dark money, partisan pressure, ideological litmus test, attacks by the President, a rubber stamp Senate, and a midnight judicial appointment. This is how courts are captured. This is how our judges can be seen to have lost their connection to the American people and to the Constitution. This is how we lose the faith of our fellow citizens. It's not too late. As a wise person once said, it's not dark yet. But ladies and gentlemen, it's getting there. I, for one, am deeply worried, and it's time we investigate the depth and the breadth of this trend. I'm looking forward to hearing from our esteemed witnesses who have agreed to share their knowledge and experiences with us today. It is now my pleasure to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentlewoman from Alabama, Ms. Roby, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our distinguished witnesses for being here with us this afternoon. This past Friday, we all learned about the passing of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg was a faithful public servant and trailblazer. She is an icon and will always be a role model for women and men of all ages in the years to come. My prayers remain with her family and loved ones. Today's hearing is entitled Maintaining Judicial Independence in the Rule of Law examining the causes and consequences of court capture. This provides a timely opportunity to examine the role and future of the federal judiciary and the justices and judges who preside over impartial justice. While the title is certainly a mouthful, we plan to discuss the resources and tactics by private groups during nomination and confirmation process of judges and the idea that one side is seemingly capturing the courts. This hearing also plans to explore the participation of sitting federal judges in legal organizations such as the Federalist Society, American Constitution Society, and the American Bar Association. Under current federal election laws, groups such as social welfare organizations, labor unions, trade associations, and chambers of commerce are not required to disclose names of individual donors unless they are making electioneering communications or independent expenditures to expressly advocate for the election or defeat of a candidate. Because these organizations generally advocate in regards to specific issues, and not endorsing or opposing specific candidates, their activities are overseen by the IRS and do not fall under FEC jurisdiction. This is in contrast to political action committees, also known as PACs, that advocate or donate on behalf of spe specific candidates. Our witnesses will discuss balancing the importance of First Amendment speech with the public's interest in understanding who is making financial contributions. This hearing will also cover what the majority has termed court capture, which describes the idea that one party is taking over the courts, apparently by nefarious means. Regardless of who is president, regardless of what party they come from, if there is an opening on the federal judiciary, the president should nominate a person for that role, and the Senate should decide whether the candidate is qualified enough to be confirmed so our federal courts can continue to function effectively. 
during the nomination and confirmation process, it is proper and the American public should be able to voice their opinions to their elected officials about who they believe would be the best nominee. Whether a person's voice is expressed through a letter, phone call, email, or financial donation, the public should be able to make their voices heard. Private organizations have the right under current finance laws to advocate for policy positions and laws. A president and senators ultimately have the only authority on the judicial nominees, not outside groups, no matter how much money they spend with their advocacy campaign. Just because a president, whether Democratic or Republican, nominates a candidate for the federal bench does not mean that they are, quote, capturing the courts, end quote. Finally, we will hear from our witnesses on Advisory Opinion 117 released by the Judicial Conference Code of Conduct Committee earlier this year. In this advisory opinion, the committee determined that membership in the American Bar Association was acceptable, but membership in the Federalist Society and the American Constitution Society was inconsistent with the Federal Judges Code of Conduct canons. Following reports of the draft advisory opinion, there was, a, there was widespread criticism and concerns on the reasoning behind barring membership in certain organizations while allowing membership in others. The Administrative Office of the U.S. Courts decided to ultimately table Advisory Opinion 117 and not publish it. Although at this time the issue is largely moot, I still look forward to hearing from our witnesses on this issue. I want to again thank all of our distinguished witnesses for being here with us this afternoon, and I look forward to hearing your testimony on all of these very important issues. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentlelady from Alabama. There being no uh, opening statements from either uh, full committee chair or ranking member of the full committee, I will proceed now to our witness. I will now introduce the uh, first panelist. Sheldon, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse has represented the state of Rhode Island in the United States Senate since 2007, where he serves on the Judiciary Committee, the Finance Committee, the Environment and Public Works Committee, and the Budget Committee. Before being elected to the Senate, Senator Whitehouse served as Rhode Island's U.S. Attorney and State Attorney General. Senator Whitehouse is a graduate of Yale University and the University of Virginia School of Law. Welcome, Senator Whitehouse, and you may begin. And before, before your testimony, however, I'm reminding you that your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to penalties of perjury pursuant to 18 U.S.C. Section 1001 which may result in the imposition of a fine or imprisonment of up to five years of both. And with that, uh, you may proceed. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, members of the committee. Uh, first, I pay respect to Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose life was a uniquely American story of passion and courage, leavened with determination and purpose to achieve justice and progress. She deserves a special place in America's pantheon. She will join our history among the greats, and I honor her today. Second, I ask that our Senate Democratic report on court capture and a Harvard Journal on Legislation article be made a part of the record. Without objection. Mr. Chairman, the Supreme Court vacancy created by Justice Ginsburg's death makes this hearing salient as well as poignant. To understand the forces out to control the court, we must first look back. Decades ago, business interests spooked by upheaval in American society needed a plan. Powerful men objected to the rise of the anti-war, environmental, civil rights, and women's rights movements. Polluters dreaded accountability for the damage they were doing to our air and water. Tobacco interests dreaded accountability for the deaths they were causing. Corporate interests felt threatened. So the U.S. Chamber of Commerce turned to a prominent lawyer for corporate and tobacco interests. His recommendation, corporate interests must get strongly involved in politics with a focus 
on controlling America's courts. The lawyer's name was Lewis Powell. Weeks later, Powell went on to the Supreme Court, where in 1978 he led the 5-4 to four decision that first required a role for corporations in American politics, a role which has grown into often corporate dominance of American politics. For big special interests, the rewards of an amenable judiciary are immense. A well-stocked bench can deliver things elected members of Congress would never vote for, such as letting corporations spend unlimited money, even nowadays anonymous, untraceable dark money in our elections, or undoing the Voting Rights Act. The prizes are enormous, and big special interests have the stamina to play the long game, which they did. So fast forward 40-some years from Lewis Powell's memo, today, a dark money-funded private organization, the Federalist Society, has a dominant role in the selection of federal judges. Another dark money-funded private organization, the Judicial Crisis Network, takes anonymous donations, some as much as $17 million, to fund political ad campaigns for nominees' confirmations. Other dark money-funded private organizations troll the country for plaintiffs of convenience to bring cases before the court that advance the big donor's agenda, and an obliging court majority relaxes standing requirements to hear those preferred cases. Dark money-funded organizations then appear at the court in chorus by the orchestrated dozen as amici curiae, friends of the court. It's big. Last year, the Washington Post published an investigation showing Leonard Leo of the Federalist Society at the center of a sweeping web of groups fueled by at least a quarter billion dollars of dark money out to control the federal judiciary. This has the earmarks of a massive covert operation, screened behind dark money secrecy, run by a small handful of big special interests against their own country. In occasional glimpses, we see the same family fortunes and corporate interests suggesting a common scheme. We see overlap in funding sources, staff, board members, lawyers, mail drops, and office locations. We see cutouts, front groups, false narratives, hidden funding. It has the tradecraft of a covert op. Behind all of that mess lurks a dark money-funded hothouse to incubate and propagate legal theories that give intellectual cover to the donor's agenda. And we don't know much about travel and hospitality emoluments for justices because they are less transparent than the legislative and executive branches. A quarter billion dollars is a lot of money. You don't spend that kind of money unless you expect something for it. So look at climate change. The International Monetary Fund cal calculates the US subsidy for fossil fuel at $600 billion, billion with a B, per year. So if you can get five Republican appointees onto the Supreme Court, knock back the clean power plan, and stall progress on climate change for several years, the monetary value of that one delay could be hundreds of billions of dollars. The capture scheme is an investment with perhaps a thousand to one return. Climate is a target, but there are many other issues targeted by this operation. Voter suppression, where Leonard Leo, via the so-called Honest Elections Project, a rebrand of the Judicial Education Project, sister organization of the Judicial Crisis Network, is creating, as The Guardian reported, and I quote, a system where conservative donors have an avenue to both oppose voting rights and appoint judges to back that effort. Destroying Obamacare with a case to be argued in less than two months in the Supreme Court. Breaking the independence of regulatory agencies under the confected unitary executive theory. Neutering and crippling the civil jury to protect mighty corporate interests from the indignity of equal treatment before the law in a courtroom. And the grand prize, the evil that makes other evils possible, a First Amendment right to anonymous dark money in politics. Big special interests are already asserting that theory in anticipation. As this anonymously funded apparatus grasps for this Supreme Court vacancy, there are big questions for Congress to answer. Why does so much special interest dark money surround the court? Why have there been over 80 
partisan five to four decisions under Chief Justice Roberts giving victories to big Republican donor interests? Why has the court been so feckless about proper disclosure from these groups? Are the various front groups, in fact, one large common scheme? And what and whose are its goals? Whoever is behind this scheme, what business do they have before the court? Drill down. Follow the money. Who gave two $17 million-plus donations to the Judicial Crisis Network to fund political campaigns against Judge Garland and for Judge Gorsuch and to prop up Judge Kavanaugh's troubled confirmation? Add to that another newly disclosed $15 million donation. From whom? What business did these donors or this repeat donor have before the court? Who are the anonymous donors colluding with Leonard Leo to funnel that quarter billion dollars into this scheme? And what do they expect in return? This obviously matters. A baked-in bias within the federal judiciary for special interests scheming behind an array of dark money front groups is a rotten situation that inflicts long-term harm on our judiciary. For those who say both sides are to blame, great, join me in fixing it. Let's bring transparency to judicial nominations, amicus briefs, and judges' gifts and hospitality, no matter who is paying. Mr. Chairman, the sooner we clean up this mess, the sooner courts can escape the grimy swamps of dark money influence and return to their proper place in the broad and sunlit uplands of earned public trust. Thank you, sir, for taking on this unpleasant but necessary challenge, and thank you for allowing me the opportunity to present these remarks today. Thank you for your long-time work on this uh, very important issue and others related to the integrity of the judicial process and system, and I thank you for your testimony today. Mr. Chairman? Who seeks to be recognized? Yes. Uh, gentlemen, you have recognized. The, the senator is not going to take questions? No. I think the last time the senator was in front of the oversight committee, he took questions from the members. It's, I mean, he, he came in here and leveled all kinds of accusations against Republicans, and it's not, not going to take any questions from us? Well, as the gentleman knows, it's our custom and tradition uh, to not pose questions to our fellow uh, uh, colleagues when they appear as witnesses. A good senator from Rhode Island took questions from us in the, in the oversight committee just not too long ago, because I was in that committee and asked him some questions. Well, it was not compulsory, and I guess the chair of the committee allowed it to happen, uh, but our... Um, Does the senator not want to take our questions? Yeah, our uh, agreement with the senator is that he would not take questions. That was our mutual understanding along with the uh, subcommittee. So with that, uh, the gentleman has uh, departed, and we now have our second esteemed panel uh, that is ready to go. Um, is there a need for recess? Or something? Okay. All right. So at this time, we will reconvene to hear the testimony of our second panel, I will now introduce our second, second panel of witnesses. Uh, professor Tom Ginsberg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law, Ludwig and Hilde Wolf Research Scholar, and Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Ginsberg focuses on comparative and inter international law from an interdisciplinary perspective. Professor Ginsberg has written and co-written award-winning books, including How to Save a Constitutional Democracy with Aziz Z. Hook, Judicial Review in the Democracies and the New Democracies, The Endurance of National Constitutions and Judicial Reputation. He currently co-directs the Com Comparative Constitutions Project, an effort funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze the constitutions of all independent nation states since 1789. Professor Ginsberg holds the BA, 
JD and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. Thank you, uh, sir, for your appearance today. Mr. Ilya Shapiro is the director of the Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute and publisher, <coughs> excuse me, publisher of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Before joining Cato, he was a special assistant advisor to the multinational force in Iraq on rule of law issues, and he practiced at Patton Boggs and Cleary, Cleary, Cleary Gottlieb. Mr. Shapiro is the author of Supreme Disorder, Judicial Nominations, and the Politics of America's Highest Court, co-authored of a co-author of Religious Liberties for Corporations, Hobby Lobby, the Affordable Care Act, and the Constitution, and editor of 11 volumes of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Mr. Shapiro received his bachelor's degree from Princeton University, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and his JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Welcome, sir. Judge Nancy Gertner is a senior lecturer on law at Harvard Law School and a former U.S. District Court judge out of Massachusetts. Judge Gertner was appointed to the federal bench by President Bill Clinton in 1994. In 2008, Judge Gertner was the second woman to receive the Thurgood Marshall Award from the American Bar Association Section of Individual Rights and Liberties. Judge Ginsburg was the first. After retiring from the bench in 2011, Judge Gertner joined the faculty at Harvard Law School where she has taught a number of subjects including criminal law, criminal procedure, forensic science, and sentencing, and has continued to teach and write about women's issues around the world. Judge Gertner received her bachelor's degree from Barnard College an MA in political science from Yale University, and her JD from Yale Law School. Welcome, uh, Judge. Last but not least, Professor Amanda, um, Amanda Hollis Bruski is an associate professor of politics at Pomona College, where she teaches courses on American politics, the Supreme Court, and constitutional law. Professor Hollis Bruski is co-founder of the Southern California Law and Social Science Forum, and editor at The Monkey Cage, a political science blog hosted by the Washington Post, and the author of two books and several articles on the Supreme Court and contemporary legal movements. Professor Hollis Bruski received her bachelor's degree in philosophy and political science from Boston University and her MA and PhD degrees in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. Welcome, Professor. And uh, we are happy to have you all here as a panel. And before you proceed with your testimony, I want to remind you that all, all of your written and oral statements made to the subcommittee in connection with this hearing are subject to 18 USC section 1001. Please note that your written statements will be rented, uh, entered into the record in its entirety. I ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there is a timing light in WebEx. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to, to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes has, have expired. Professor Ginsburg, you may now begin. Thank you very much, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, and all the members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss today a topic I've been researching for many years. My work is on the origins, maintenance, and decline of constitutional democracy around the world, and work has taken me to dozens of countries. Of course, I appear before you today at a time when Americans are worried about the quality of our own democracy, and when the appointment of a Supreme Court justice is again going to be a major topic of discussion during our presidential election campaign. It's a good time to be thinking about the role of courts in democracy uh, and how to ensure that our high-quality judiciary can fulfill its responsibilities under the Constitution. At the same time, it's a moment of some risk. 
Major battles over judicial appointments risk politicizing the courts and depriving them of the legitimacy that's essential to their function. And this is not just a concern of scholars and journalists and court watchers uh, or those who've been tracking signs of democratic erosion in the United States. But much more importantly, it's a concern of the American people themselves, whose perception of an independent judiciary that can constrain executive power is low and in decline on both sides of the political aisle. Now, it's my view that even an old democracy like the United States can learn from the dynamics of democratic backsliding and democratic resilience around the world. And one of the things we observe in the context of democratic erosion is what might be called political capture of the judiciary. In recent decades, uh, for many reasons, courts have become very important in the politics of many countries. And this means that leaders who wish to take over their political systems first look to the courts as a first step in trying to end electoral competition. And this has occurred in countries like Venezuela, Turkey, Hungary, even Poland. At the same time, we also see uh, countries in which the courts play a critical role in saving constitutional democracy in places like Colombia and Sri Lanka. So in my view, these uh, uh, outside information is relevant as we think about our own judiciary. Now, it's also my view that fighting election campaigns, presidential elections over judicial appointments is a distortion of our democracy. And so a key objective for Congress in coming years must be to reduce the stakes of appointments to the federal bench. Lower the temperature of judicial appointments be good for our democracy, good for our judiciary as well. One way to do this would be to regularize, regularize the appointments process, and many other countries do this. Note that current discussions are not just about what kind of justice should be appointed to replace Justice Ginsburg, but the very procedure by which that person will be nominated and confirmed. And uh, this is obviously not healthy. Procedures must be you know, set in advance. In fact, I don't see in the current moment any principal stopping point in our partisan escalation. We could soon be in a situation where all appointments to the Supreme Court, maybe even all federal courts, could only be made in periods when the presidency and Senate were in the hands of the same party. And this would have lead to episodic rushes to confirm judges who are ever younger, less experienced for the public to evaluate, not good for the country, the court, or our democracy. Now, it's true procedure is largely in control of the Senate's internal rules, but it doesn't mean that Congress couldn't pass a statute seeking to regularize the procedure in terms of timelines, providing for outside vetting, and doing other things like introducing qualifications for federal judges, such as practice experience, which has arisen in a small number of recent nominations. Uh, the chairman mentioned the lack of a code of ethics for the Supreme Court, which is also something that could be addressed. And all these things, I think, would give the public confidence that the procedure and standards uh, filling the judiciary and the people taking those jobs are not simply being manipulated on a partisan basis. So I would like to see that. I would also like to see us redirect the courts to fundamental issues of protecting our democracy. Right now, the dominant image of the courts is this kind of a referee between the two parties, famously captured by Justice Roberts in his own confirmation hearing, in which he said the job of the judge was to call balls and strikes. And the problem is in a polarized era uh, where the players themselves are picking the ump, each side is trying to get the calls sort of shaded to their side and send more and more questions up to that umpire. And my view is that most political decisions should be in the hands of democratic processes. And so the important role for courts is to preserve those processes. Our courts do well in some core democratic areas like freedom of speech, freedom of association. They do less well in areas like the Voting Rights Act. And that's where I'd like to see uh, Congress give, instruct courts to give the right to vote maximum effect and to undo many of the efforts to um, suppress the vote that we've seen since the passage of the case of Shelby County. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professor Ginsburg. Mr. Shapiro, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, <clears throat> distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss judicial independence and the rule of law. Judicial independence is, of course, an important part of our constitutional structure, allowing the third branch of the federal government to check the others. Those checks and balances maintain the separation of powers, which in turn protects our liberty by preventing the concentration of power. Now, this hearing's subtitle implies that something called court capture is a threat to the rule of law, yet I'm not sure that the courts have been captured or even what such a capture would look like. 
Is it simply that President Trump has gotten many judges confirmed? Uh, although this administration has had particular success with circuit judges, 53 confirmed with no remaining vacancies, its 216 Article III judges represent only about a quarter of all such judges and less than a quarter of the authorized 870 Article III judgeships. By comparison, President Carter had 262 judges confirmed in one term, including 59 circuit judges, while President George H.W. Bush had 193. If President Trump loses his bid for re-election, his total will not be much higher than the first President Bush's, and significantly lower than that of President Carter, for whom Congress created many new judgeships to fill. And if President Trump is re-elected, even assuming the Republicans keep the Senate, it's unlikely that his two-term total would be significantly higher than our last two presidents, George W. Bush with 327, Obama with 329. For one thing, there are currently only about 60 vacancies, mostly for district judges in states where Democratic senators have refused to negotiate any sort of deals, preferring to leave their states shorthanded. In other words, if the judiciary has been captured, it's the sort of capture we see under every president and probably overstated given the district court nominees in states like New York, where the Democratic senators have indeed made deals. Maybe the nominees themselves have been captured by particular interests. This can happen with elected state judges, and historically, judicial politics have indeed been swayed by interests ranging from plantation slavery to the railroads, manufacturers, to New Deal allegiances. Senator Whitehouse's own chosen federal judge, John McConnell of the District of Rhode Island, was a well-known personal injury trial lawyer who gave generously to left-wing causes. But there's no indication that this administration's nominees are beholden to the entertainment or hotel industries in which Donald Trump plied his trade before coming down that golden escalator. To his credit, the president has let the White House Counsel's Office run the show. Senators will occasionally insist on their local favorites, but the ratio of intellectually rigorous and independent nominees to establishmentarians is exceedingly high. And the result has been this president's biggest success, with judges of the same caliber as those whom conservative constitutionalist Ted Cruz would have picked. This administration has surpassed even George W. Bush in picking committed and youthful originalists, particularly in the circuit courts. Former White House counsel Don McGahn likes to say that rather than outsourcing judicial selection to the Federalist Society or anyone else, he had insourced the operation, meaning that his team, which was leaner than in previous administrations, all understood the need for solid judges with a record of accomplishment and demonstrated commitment to originalism and textualism. That's why it's no surprise that so many of President Trump's nominees are already superstars and why Democrats have tried to smear them in various ways. Senator Dianne Feinstein said about Seventh Circuit Judge Amy Coney Barrett, now a finalist for Justice Ginsburg's seat, that the dogma lives loudly within you, which sounds like a rejected Star Wars line. Fifth Circuit Judge Don Willett was assailed for humorous tweets. D.C. Circuit Judge Naomi Rao and Second Circuit Judge Stephen Menasche were attacked for their pretty standard conservative or libertarian collegiate writings. California Senators Feinstein and Kamala Harris tried especially hard to block their home state's Patrick Bumatai, who became the first openly gay Ninth Circuit judge and first circuit judge of Filipino descent. Indeed, Democratic senators have used every trick in the book to stop uh, or slow this high judicial confirmation train, which Harry Reid eliminated for the lower courts in 2013, so they forced more cloture votes than all previous presidencies combined. Nearly 80 percent of Trump's judicial nominees have faced cloture votes, including many who are confirmed with upwards of 90 votes. In comparison, about 3 percent of Obama's nominees faced cloture votes and fewer than 2 percent in the previous five presidencies. To put it in another way, Trump's 216 Article III judicial appointees have received more than 4,600 no votes, while Obama's 329 got 2,000 and 39. Trump's judges have received nearly half of all no votes in U.S. history, in fact. One final statistic. The average Democrat has voted against nearly half of all Trump uh, nominees, while the average Republican voted against fewer than 10 percent of Obama's. It's a shame that quality nominees are confirmed in party line votes. But we've gotten here because we're at the culmination of long trends where different legal theories map onto ideologically sorted parties, as I detail in my new book, Supreme Disorder, which actually just came out today. None of this is a sign of capture. Uh, political considerations have always been part of the process. Thank you, and I welcome your questions, including about actual threats to judicial independence, like court packing. Thank you.
Judge Gertner, uh, you may begin. I thank the gentleman for his testimony. Thank you. Representative Johnson, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Roby, and members of the committee, let me start by saying that I don't want to just memorialize Justice Ginsburg. I was a friend, and I candidly mourn her. Uh, I was a federal judge for 17 years, serving in the District of Massachusetts. I left the bench to become a full-time professor of practice at Harvard Law School. I'm now teaching there part-time, as well as teaching criminal law at Yale Law School this semester. My testimony here derives from my judicial experience. My goal is to be as dispassionate and careful in this testimony as I know how to be. I testify today because of my deep concern for the party's, the public's growing view of the bench as partisan and thus not meaningfully different from the other branches. The legitimacy of the courts depends upon the public's belief in its neutrality. Their faith in the institution depends upon their trust that it is fully and completely independent of the political process. Attacks on the judiciary by our president undermine that legitimacy and that faith. When the president criticizes opinions with which he disagrees as coming from Obama or Clinton judges, he undermines all judges and the institution as a whole. That's why Chief Justice Roberts made clear that we don't have, quote, Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. We have an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them, unquote. But the selection process for federal judges under the Trump administration, in my view, undermines the Chief Justice's observations. While in the past, there have not been Bush one, Bush two, Clinton, or Obama judges. There are, or at least I fear the public perceives that there are, quote, Trump judges. The administration has explicitly said as much. These are, after all, quote, his judges. The unique judicial selection process has produced them, and the public's perception of Trump judges could undermine the rest of the bench. I talk about 28 U.S.C. 1404, I mean, it's 455A, which is a provision of the judicial code that, of, the, of the statutes that talks about not just the reality of bias, but the appearance of bias. And my concern is that how one selects judges for a life tenured position may well be as important as who you select. How you select plays a role in determining the respect with which the public holds the bench. While in the past, the public understood that the process was political in the sense that the president nominated the candidates, one thing was clear. No matter who the president was, the pipeline for judicial appointments was wide and bipartisan often. The range of acceptable views was broad. Candidates, as, as Senator Lindsey Graham has said, were in the mainstream of judicial thought, whether or not they were on the right or the left side of that stream. But this process has been truncated, partisan, and seems to depend upon the imprimatur of one organization, directly affecting the way the public perceives the bench. Even before the president was sworn in, he announced a, quote, slate of nominees in a way that resonated with the kind of slate one sees in a judicial election. And it was not an ordinary slate, as Professor Hollis Bruski will describe. It was curated by one organization, the Federalist Society. In fact, at one point, in a, uh, Leonard Leo was quoted as saying to the president, that's a great idea. You're creating a brand, a judicial brand, precisely what casts doubt on the independence of the judiciary. In fact, the relationship between the president's nominees and the Federalist Society has been praised by Orrin Hatch, by Don McGahn, Yes, these are people that have, this is a set of nominees that have been outsourced to the Federalist Society. Contrast that with the statements of other Republican administrations. William Marshall uh, 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 in a Federalist Society panel said, we are now treating elections as if they're mandates to change the meaning of the Constitution. That is troubling. And Professor William Kelly at the same uh, uh, meeting said, it seems to license people to do what they otherwise might not do. It's one thing to have a political view when you come into office, 
It's another thing to be told by the election process that it's okay to apply that political view in your opinions. Over-politization of the process provides a license to judicial nominees to effectuate their choices. In short, I'm not talking about whether these are qualified or not, these candidates are qualified. Uh, I focus on the process by which they are selected, what that process communicates to the public and the ways in which it under, undermines the public's perception of the bench. If the public believes that one, that these nominees are the arm of one political party or worse, of a subgroup of that party, the core faith in an independent judiciary is undermined. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Gertner. Professor Hollis Brusky, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the members of this committee for the opportunity to testify this afternoon. My name is Amanda Hollis Brusky, and I'm an associate professor of politics at Pomona College. I'm also the author of two books on the Supreme Court and the conservative legal movement. In my written testimony, I draw on my own published work, as well as that of other law and court scholars, to provide thorough and detailed answers grounded in research to the question animating today's hearing. In my brief remarks this, this afternoon, I wanna highlight one development in particular that threatens to undermine judicial independence and the rule of law. That is the growing public perception of a judiciary that appears to be both driven by partisan politics and captured by a single interest group. I'll talk about the corrosive effects this has on the people's perception of the judicial branch as an independent, neutral arbiter of law and of the Constitution. Our current court is at once more partisan and more divided than any time in the last 100 years. Since 2010, the Supreme Court has been strictly divided along party lines, not just ideological lines, with every justice appointed by a Democratic president voting more liberally than every justice appointed by a Republican president and vice versa. Far from being the historical norm, this partisan divide is out of step with traditional patterns of voting and alignment on the court. It is also the most divided court since the New Deal Court of the 1930s. In its decisions, the current Supreme Court has split or sharply divided, for example, 5-4, on nearly one of every five decisions it has handed down. And that's the highest rate of division in 100 years. This means that more often than not, votes on major issues that affect millions of Americans on health care, housing discrimination, who gets to get married, gun control, reproductive rights, the separation of church and state, who gets to stay in this country and who gets deported, come down to a single vote. And more often than not, that vote has been five to four along party lines. The current partisan divide on the Supreme Court is amplified by the fact that the five Republican appointed justices all have identifiable ties to a single organization the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. I write extensively about the Federal Society and its influence on the Supreme Court and Republican judicial selection in my book, Ideas with Consequences, The Federalist Society and the Conservative Counter-Revolution. But for the purposes of this hearing, I'll emphasize a single point about the organization. Over the past three and a half decades, the Federal Society has achieved, and I'll quote one of its members here directly, a de facto monopoly on the training, selection, and disciplining of Republican-appointed judges. Over the course of the Trump administration, as I and many others have documented, this influence has become at once more visible and more consolidated than ever before. All of this has consequences for court legitimacy. The currency of the court, its only real power, is its legitimacy. Its power to persuade we the people that its decisions are legitimate and grounded in law, not grounded in partisan politics or influenced by interest group politics. We know from political science that the single greatest threat to the, the, to the legitimacy of the judiciary is when the public begins to believe, and I quote, that judges are little more than politicians in robes. When the judiciary is viewed as just another political institution, people lose faith in the legitimacy of the court, people lose faith in the rule of law. Now, whether or not judges and justices are actually motivated in their decisions by their partisan allegiances, that doesn't matter. And whether or not the Republican appointed judges and justices on the federal bench, now numbering around 400 in total, 
are actually influenced by their connections with and membership in the federal society, that doesn't really matter either. What matters is how all of this looks to we the people. Research tells us that the appearance of partisan motivated voting, the appearance of federal society capture will harm the people's faith in and trust in the federal judiciary. So what it looks like, how it's perceived by the public should matter to anyone who cares about judicial independence and the rule of law. And it should matter especially to the members of this body and the members of this committee. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you, Professor Hollis Bruski. Um, we are, our votes has, have been called. I understand it will be three votes. Um, since we're in the middle of the first vote, I recommend that uh, the witnesses be subjected to questions from myself and also Ms. Roby, at which time we will then uh, recess for the members to vote. Uh, I suggest that the members remain for the second vote uh, and vote and then come back to committee whereupon we will resume questioning of the witnesses as, as far as we can get until uh, it's time to go vote for that third vote. And uh, there being no objection that I've heard, I would now um, ask the ranking member to consider uh, the request that I tended to her earlier of allowing uh, our colleague, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee, to uh, maintain a seat on the podium during the hearing. Mr. Chairman, I have no objection, but I would like to note uh, for the record, I have no objection to my friend and colleague uh, joining us here on the dais today, but I would like to note for the record that there is at least one instance in another subcommittee where the minority has made a similar request and not been extended the same courtesy. And I believe that's very unfortunate, but welcome uh, Mrs. Sheila Jackson Lee to the dais today. Well, if I could uh, assure the uh, ranking member who has always uh, extended courtesy to me, uh, that courtesy would always be re-extended to you. We would not be uh, hypocritical in any way. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank the chair lady. And with that, we will begin our uh, questions of the first witness. Uh, we proceed under the five minute rule. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Professor Ginsburg, you've written that the federal courts have acquired legitimacy with the public through their association with historical causes such as the civil rights movement. But now the courts, and particularly the Supreme Court, are increasingly associated with efforts to dismantle the rights that once helped, that they once helped secure. The right to vote, the right to be free from discrimination because of your age, your gender, your language, or the color of your skin, the right to control your own body, the right to clean air and clean water. It's all been rolled back. Professor Ginsburg, is this trend consistent with your vision of courts as bulwarks against democratic backsliding? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. It's certainly consistent with my view of the role that courts should play in terms of facilitating democracy and not uh, you know, reducing participation, taking actions which are activist in nature and hurt the majority. Uh, and that seems to be what many of the things you listed would fall under the category of. Uh, the fact is this term activism often gets thrown around. And actually I see in my friend, uh, Professor Shapiro's testimony even notes that activism is something more of an epithet than an analytic tool these days. But the fact is many of the decisions which have come under uh, the, in recent years, many of the most consequential decisions can be described as nothing other than activist attempts uh, to roll back the administrative state, to reduce the right to vote, uh, and to facilitate a uh, free flow of money in our politics. That's my view, uh, of my reading of those decisions. Thank you, uh, Judge Gertner. What happens to our democracy when the judiciary becomes associated with weakening people's basic rights instead of protecting them? And you uh, may unmute yourself, please. Federal judges are not used to being muted. 
thank you for your question. Uh, I think that the, the role that an independent judiciary has played in the United States, and I might add as an icon for the rest of the world, has been uh, the role of supporting minority rights against, uh, against a majority political party, for example. That was what the carve out was for Brown versus Board of Education for the various LGBTQ decisions. When the majority majoritarian institutions failed to protect minority rights, the Supreme Court stepped in. The view of the court is protecting majority rights, protecting corporate rights is a new one and inconsistent with what it has been in the past. But my concern is not just the direction of the court, my concern is the perception of the direction of the court. It, it is, uh, I think as Professor Ginsburg described, and what I've begun to call the undoing project, the project to undo the rights and the core principles of the past 40 years on the bench. So activism no longer means, uh, you know, uh, rejecting, no longer suggests that rejecting precedent is a bad thing. Uh, we now have literature, particularly from the Federalist Society, describing the importance of overturning precedent and overturning settled expectations in the court. But my point with before was really more, even if one agrees with that, one has to be troubled by a single lane pipeline to the United States Supreme Court and the lower federal courts, which is a pipeline that is monitored and controlled uh, by one organization. Even if you agree with them, that has got to be a troubling development. I'm sorry, you didn't hear my question. I, I didn't have my uh, mic on, uh, Professor Hollis Brusky. What I'd like for you to uh, respond to is the question, what happens to our democracy when a judiciary associated with weakening people's rights is associated with ideological and partisan groups funded uh, by uh, groups like the Federalist Society? Thank you for the question. So under a certain theory of government, it's important to recognize that the judicial role should be a minimal role. In fact, this was the same theory of government embraced by people like Justice Scalia back in the 1980s, judges like J. Harvey Wilkinson, who believed that judges should exercise restraint, particularly when it came to the will of the democratic majority. And so the role of the judge was to, in most cases, whenever possible, uphold the democratic will, but in those cases where the Constitution clearly commanded it to strike down infringements on minority rights or to hold the democratic majority accountable to provisions of the Constitution. Now, this used to be called judicial restraint, and the opposite of that would be judicial activism, a judicial branch that goes out of its way to overturn long-established precedent a judicial branch that moves the law too far too fast, and a judicial branch that answers questions that are not asked of it. So in my book, Ideas with Consequences, I talk in particular about the decision in Citizens United and how this represented a new kind of judicial activism within the federal society. The Roberts Court answered a question that was not asked of it and used this decision as a vehicle to further deregulate campaign finance law, which handcuffs the people's ability to control the corrosive effects of money in elections. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. Uh, next, we will have five minutes of questions from the gentlelady from Alabama, Congresswoman Roby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Shapiro, I'll give you an opportunity if you want to respond uh, to any of the other witnesses' responses to the chairman's questions. I appreciate that. Thanks very much. I, um, on the topic of uh, Shelby County, which has 
has been mentioned a few times. I have uh, a law review article called Shelby County and the Vindication of Martin Luther King's Dream. I'll, I'll send that to your staff to be entered into the record rather than taking up the um, the, the oral time for that. But this uh, idea of the Federalist Society, I think it's been mischaracterized. I want to push back on this idea of a single lane pipeline or a dominant interest group because the Federalist Society isn't an interest group. It's a network of lawyers and law students. It's a membership organization. It's much like the American Bar Association. In fact, it was formed to be a counterpart to the academy for law students and to the ABA for practicing lawyers, both of which uh, had then and probably even more have now a uh, left-wing or progressive skew. Uh, and to be clear, I have been a member uh, of the Federalist Society for 20 years. In fact, 20 years ago, I was a first-year law student. It was right about now, 20 years ago, that I was joining it. And I've never been asked by anyone at the Federalist Society to take any position, uh, uh, acknowledge any position, sign my name to uh, any statement. I'm constantly asked, however, about how best to frame a discussion in a particular area of constitutional law or legal policy, uh, or whether I'd be amenable to debating a point I've made in a recent article with another member of the Federalist Society. Um, you know, Federal Society strives, strives to present debates and otherwise expose students to a wide range of ideas. It's not a monolith. Uh, in fact, during the same-sex marriage litigation, for example, law school faculty often refused to engage uh, in the battle of ideas, so the Federal Society would provide both speakers, including frequently me. I was on the uh, pro-same-sex marriage side to hold debates. The Federal Society counts as members people who apply many different kinds of interpretive methods, from natural law theorists to libertarians, um, those who believe in judicial restraint and those who believe in judicial engagement, uh, textualists and pragmatists, lovers of Chevron deference, and those who want to deconstruct the administrative state. Indeed, Federal Society member jurists who are textualists nominated by the same president can disagree, as we saw this past term in the Boss Talk case, uh, in which uh, Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh argued against each other about the meaning of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And of course, that decision gave fuel to the rising so-called common good constitutionalists. That was criticism by Senator Josh Hawley of the efficacy of a conservative legal movement that, in his view, increasingly fails to produce results for the voters to empower who empower it. In, in short, um, there is no monolith. Uh, there is no uh, 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 talking points or marching orders. Uh, I've had many more debates, but certainly many more productive debates with other members of the Federal Society, or as much as more as, as, as with the American Constitution Society uh, or otherwise. What it is is a signaling mechanism to show that you're unafraid to declare at your law school, because most are very left-leaning, as I said, especially the student bodies, uh, that you are committed to uh, certain principles, originalism, textualism, certain uh, modes of interpretation. This is not about being results-oriented. That might be uh, a bit of projection, perhaps, from uh, some people uh, on the other side. Um, it's it's about uh, intellectual rigor uh, and and uh, commitment to taking ideas uh, seriously and and the commitment to indeed the focus of this panel, uh, the rule of law and judicial independence. Mr. Shapiro, some academics and stakeholders have argued for increased donor disclosure laws, particularly as it. Um, relates to spending by 501c organizations. Do you have any concerns about compelling donor disclosure and how that may chill free speech? I, I do. I detail some of that in my uh, in my written uh, remarks. Um, but just to summarize, um, going back to NAACP versus Alabama, the idea that the freedom of speech for independent speech, we're not even talking about donations or support of particular candidates or parties, um, that the state will demand anyone who is uh, participating in that certainly will chill uh, activity. I, you know, I work for the Cato Institute. We're a 501c3, not a c4. Uh, but still, we're very jealous of our donors' privacy uh, because the freedom of association and private association are important constitutional protections. Thank you. My time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, the gentlelady. Uh, we will recess uh, to take votes one and two.
We should be back in probably 30 to 45 minutes, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And we appreciate your forbearance with us. Hey, Elena, how are you doing? Uh, it's great, yeah, it's great to be on a panel with you. I'm, I'm doing well. Today's the release date of There we go. Now I'm not hearing you. Guys, so just to remind everyone, you can be heard inside of the hearing room and online. So ah. it's going to go on complete.
Okay, so we are going to be starting momentarily. If all of the witnesses can now come to the witness table, turn on your cameras, you can keep yourselves muted. We are going to be starting momentarily. The hearing will resume, and with that, we will have five minutes of questions from the gentle lady from California, uh, Zoe Lofgren. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and this has been a very important um, hearing, I think, especially given the uh, events of the um, last uh, few days, the tragic loss of um, our Ruth Bader Ginsburg, such uh, a icon of justice and uh, hope for the future for equal rights. I think back on all the things that would have been different in my life had she not been uh, a member of the uh, Supreme Court. So I'd like to, to talk about how we maintain and uh, continue, or in some cases regain, um, confidence in uh, the Supreme Court. And I'd like to get into the question, and I'll ask all the witnesses, of ethics. <clears throat> right now, the Supreme Court, the Congress has basically left ethics to the court itself. Um, justices do not disclose uh, if they're taken on trips, uh, you know, who's paying for various things that they might enjoy. And I'm wondering uh, whether you think that that should be part of any steps we take. I mean, uh, there's been concern about the capture of, of the court and the role that the Federalist Society pays, but you know, is the Federalist Society also taking justices um, on trips? Um, uh, I don't know. Are other groups doing the same thing? And certainly they would, uh, if you had a direct financial interest in, in a case you would disqualify yourself, but you might have an ideological interest in a case and yet uh, be funding justices to go uh, to various trips or other benefits. What do the, uh, the various witnesses think about that subject? I'll start with you, Ms. hollis Bruski. Thank you, Congresswoman, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to that question. I want to circle back for a minute um, to uh, Mr. Shapiro's comments about what the Federal Society is. Um, and I have to say, I respectfully dissent with his portrayal of the Federal Society. And two things I want to speak to in particular. First, I think it's telling that the lone witness the Republican members of this committee have called to persuade us that there is no inappropriate relationship between the Federal Society and the Republican Party is himself a Federal Society member. Second thing I want to mention, he brought up Don McGahn's comments about insourcing judicial selection. Don McGahn was the head of White House counsel. And I was sitting next to Mr. Shapiro, in fact, at a lunch talk that Don McGahn gave the keynote at. And he doubled down when asked about what insourcing by the Federal Society meant in the Trump administration. And he said it means two things. I was in charge of judicial selection, 
as the White House counsel. I only hired Federal Society members to work in my office. Right, that was the first thing. He said they needed to demonstrate loyalty to the team. I needed to know that we were on the same page. And secondly, it meant that judicial selection was run by the vice president of the Federal Society, Leonard Leo, who was working in the White House. And it was exclusively through Leo and McGahn that judges were selected also based on their qualifications and credentials and ties to the Federal Society. So what that means is that in order to be selected as a judge or part of the judicial selection process within the Republican Party as it stands right now under President Trump, one has to be involved with the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy Studies. And I think those are important things to put in front of the committee as we debate uh, moves forward. Thank you very much. I wonder if you could comment on the ethics question that I asked. The disclosure requirements. Sure, Congresswoman. Um, so as I write in my testimony, um, my expertise is largely descriptive. And um, I'm going to talk about what I see as the major issues when it comes to the public's perception of the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. Um, I think my colleague, uh, Professor Ginsburg, is better positioned to talk about reforms given his broad expertise in comparative oh, politics. Let's turn to Professor Ginsburg then. The general lady's time has expired. Ah. Uh, I yield back then, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Five Chairman. Five minutes. Appreciate that. I'll, I'll briefly ask uh, Professor Hollis Bruski. Uh, have you ever contributed to an organization called Demand Justice? No. Have you ever contributed to an organization called the 1630 Fund? No. Because these two groups, Mr. Chairman, uh, are left-leaning groups with former Obama and Clinton staffers at the helm that uh, sought to spend $5 million to, in, in the case of Demand Justice, to try and block the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, the structure of Demand Justice allows it not only to mask the names of its donors, but the size of their contributors, uh, the size of their contributions. And the 1630 Fund reportedly spent $141 million on more than 100 left-leaning causes during the midterm election year, which surpassed any amount ever raised by a left-leaning political nonprofit. And the 1630 Fund is reportedly one of the fiscal backers of demand justice. Um, in 2019, issue one, a think tank found that liberal dark money groups outspent their conservative counterparts during the 2018 election, spending 54% of the total 150 million expended by all dark money groups. And the reality is that dark money is not swamping the system. Since Citizens United, uh, such spending has never reached even 6% of total political spending in an election cycle. In 2018, according to the numbers of the Pro-Regulation Center for Responsive Politics, it was between 2.2% and 5.2%, depending on how it's calculated. So I would ask Mr. Shapiro if he'd like to respond to any of the comments that were made uh, by the last witness. Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Um, so Don McGahn was the White House counsel. That is a government position. Uh, when he talked about insourcing, that meant that government officials were uh, selecting, debating, vetting, and ultimately recommending to the president the individuals who would be uh, nominated or considered to be nominated for judgeships. Membership in the Federalist Society in that has been used as a signaling function that has replaced Republican allegiances or partisan allegiances. In uh, decades ago, before the Federalist Society existed, or even in its early years, um, uh, indications of uh, allegiances uh, would be partisan allegiances. Um, I think it's a healthier development that we have an, intelli an intellectually rigorous uh, organization, membership organization, committed to ideas um, that is being used as that signal that you are willing to stand up and say that you uh, dissent from the kind of pro prevailing progressive orthodoxy in the legal profession. And that's what it's used as. There is no secret handshake. There is no uh, oath of allegiance. There is no agreement to uh, on any particular policy issues or legal interpretations. So I think it's perfectly appropriate for government officials, uh, as they are vetting um, 
people whom they might want to appoint. They look at uh, all sorts of characteristics, including uh, any indications of uh, devotion to a particular um, uh, methodological uh, framework to apply or, or view of uh, interpretive theories because it's wrong to ask litmus tests. It's uh, uh, inappropriate, I think, just to give these posts to cronies. Um, I think it's great to find intellectually rigorous uh, judges and uh, populate the other positions in an administration with people who ha are demonstrating uh, a commitment to ideas, not simply um, the, the old partisanship of the past. I'll leave it there. Mr. Shapiro, I, I quoted a couple of uh, statistics about the percentage of contributions of all political spending during the last election cycle, uh, and that in 2018, dark money represented between 2.2 and 5.2 percent. Do you think that statistic suggests that concerns about the use of dark money in the political process are accurate, or are these concerns a way for the left to try and silence voices on the right? I think the concerns and so-called reform efforts regarding to, regarding dark money are, are definitely an attempt to chill political speech of various kinds, whether uh, about uh, so-called normal politics or about uh, judicial confirmations. Uh, I mean, I think Demand Justice spent $5 million opposing Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, the 1630 Fund and the New Venture Fund that, that you mentioned raised nearly a billion dollars in 2017, 2018 for all sorts of purposes. Um, uh, look, uh, it's it's kind of bizarre because you can assume that whoever funds left causes believes in left wing causes, and if it's going the exact person, I'm not sure what kind of voter or other information that gives you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Mr. Deutsch, if you're if you're on camera. Uh, let yourself be seen. If not, uh, then we will go to Mr. Jeffries, the gentleman from New York, five minutes. Uh, thank the distinguished chair for convening this hearing, uh, as well as for uh, yielding. Mr. Shapiro, do you support the current effort by the Senate Republican majority to jam a replacement for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg down the throats of the American people? so close to an election day? I haven't made up my mind precisely on the on the strategy, and a lot will depend on how the nomination proceeds, how the hearing process uh, uh, commences. Uh, Senator McConnell has not committed to ha having a, a vote before the election. It might happen after. We'll, we'll have to see. I can tell you that historically, um, the main determinant is whether there's unified government, whether the same party controls the White House and the Senate. In those cases, in election year vacancies, all but twice has there been a confirmation. Conversely, when there is a, when the Senate and White House are controlled by opposing parties, only once has there been a confirmation. So historically speaking, there's plenty of precedent to confirm uh, in the same year. Uh, right. Politics always reclaim, works reclaim, differently. Reclaim, however, reclaim, so reclaim, gonna, reclaiming, reclaiming my time, sir. I've got limited time. Uh, you, you apparently took a very different position in 2016, so I'm just trying to get an understanding of what accounts for the difference. I, I just ask um, Mr. Johnson uh, for unanimous consent to enter into the record a Forbes article dated February 14, 2016, written by Mr. Shapiro entitled, Don't Confirm Scalia's Replacement Until After the Election. Without objection. So. On February 14th, which is one day after Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia died, you wrote an op-ed for Forbes uh, entitled, Don't Confirm Scalia's Replacement Until After the Election. Is there anything in that article that talks about this unified government theory of why this would be an exception at this moment right now? I don't have the article in front of me, but what I've argued, what I argued throughout the the saga uh, over the battle to, to fill the Scalia seat and the nomination of Merrick Garland is that um, uh, divided government is different than unified government. And equally or more importantly, we had a situation where the voters had reelected President Obama in 2012 and then gave, given the Republicans the Senate in 2014. And so, in effect, 2016 was the 
the deciding rubber match, uh, uh, if you will. And so, I mean, ultimately, voters are going to have to decide whether uh, the positions that politicians of both parties are taking now. There's a lot of switching sides uh, involved. Um, Thanks a lot. Reclaiming, reclaiming, reclaiming my time. You wrote in your article, just to refresh your recollection, in this hazy, crazy, bizarre election year, his seat should remain vacant until the American people can decide whether they want to swing the balance of the Supreme Court, possibly for decades. Is that correct? That sounds right. You also argued in this article, a new president will take office in 11 months and the stakes are just too high in our politically schizophrenic nation to change the Supreme Court's direction without an interceding popular vote. Is that true? I'm sure you're accurately quoting my article. You also wrote in that article that giving the American people an opportunity to weigh in on such an important matter is every legislator's paramount duty. And given how consequential Justice Scalia's replacement will be, it would be irresponsible for the Senate to confirm any nominee President Obama may send them, correct? Sounds right. Now, Justice Scalia was a consequential justice. We can agree. Was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg a consequential justice in the history of American jurisprudence? Undoubtedly. And this election is not going to take place just 11 months away from this moment that we're in right now, as was the case when you wrote that article. It's a few weeks away. Is that correct? Correct. Did you say anything again about this unified theory of government that you and others are now inventing at this moment out of convenience? Did you say anything about that in this article in terms of making the case as to why Scalia should not be replaced? Congressman, I just wrote a book about the history of... Uh, well, let me ask one last question, sir. Just, sir, let me ask one last question just to clear it up. Uh, because my time is running out. Why does the Scalia standard not apply to Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Is it because the conservatives are bent on destroying the health care of the American people and having the ACA declared unconstitutional, and you are desperately trying to secure a Supreme Court majority to accomplish that end? Congressman, I see your time is up, but I'm not going to answer when I stop beating my wife either. The gentleman's time has expired. Thank you. I think that answer speaks for itself. I yield back. We now uh, move to uh, Ranking Member Jordan for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Professor Hollis Bruski, uh, in Senator Whitehouse's opening statement, uh, he talked about his assessment was that conservatives and Republicans, with the help of the Federalist Society, are trying to capture the court, was the word he, he used. Do you agree with uh, Senator Whitehouse's uh, assessment? Thank you for the question. Um, I don't make a claim in my written statement, and I won't make one here today, about whether they are in fact captured or whether the courts are in fact captured by the Federal Society. But what I do make an argument about is that the appearance of capture is certainly reasonable, given the optics of the Trump administration and how big of a role the Federal Society has played in judicial nominations. Since are, there other, are there other ways to capture the court? Are there other appearances of capturing the court? Ms. Hollis I'm not sure. If, uh, I'm, I'm not certain what, what, what you're asking. But well, let me give you an example. The Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader of the Senate, and a number of our Democrat colleagues have said if, in fact, they win the election and have power and take control of the government, that they are going to pack the court with six new justices. They're going to go from nine to 15. That, that seems to me like, if you, if you want to use the word capture the court, I don't think you'd come up with a better way of describing capturing the court than what the Democrats are proposing. Is that capturing the court? I think historically that's been called court packing, um, but it could certainly be viewed 
uh, as capturing the court to some extent. Yeah, we got this false idea that somehow the federal society has got this conspiracy going using dark money, when in fact, as the gentleman from Virginia pointed out, you got this, what, demand justice spending $5 billion to stop Justice Kavanaugh. You've got these two organizations, 1630 New Venture Fund spent $987 million in 2017 and 2018 alone. That's the real dark money. And the real capturing of the court is what the Democrats want to do. I mean, they, they've, been, they've been straight up about it. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna pack the court. We're going we're gonna to go from nine justices, which has been the norm of the court for 150 years. We're going to go to 15. Um, Mr. Shapiro, <clears throat> excuse me, Mr. Shapiro, in, um, Ms. hollis Bruski also said people lose faith in the rule of law when what the Democrat witnesses and Senator Whitehouse talked about if, in fact, that, that, that would happen. Um, if the Democrats win power and pack the court, would that cause Americans to lose faith in an important institution in our government, the Supreme Court? Well, I think uh, two wrongs don't make a right, and court packing historically has been a wrong that's inured to the uh, detriment of our country and, for that matter, to the party that's propounded it. I think the senator also said membership in groups dedicated to restructuring the judiciary. Uh, he used that phrase in his in his opening statement. Um, well, let me ask this question: Does the Federal Society file amicus briefs with the Supreme Court on important cases, or on any case for that matter, Mr. Shapiro? It does not. Does it endorse or oppose judicial nominees? It does not. Does not. Does not. But the, uh, but the entities on the left that are helping the Democrats, spending $987 million in two years alone, demand justice, spend $5 million just to go after Judge, uh, Judge Kavanaugh. Um, they do do those two things, don't they, Mr. Shapiro? They do, and the American Constitution Society takes positions uh, all the time um, and the ABA takes positions all the time uh, of a particular ideological bent. So it looks like the Democrats are going after the one organization that's actually doing it right, not filing briefs with, not filing amicus briefs with the court, not endorsing um, candidates, not speaking out on certain cases, but they're the ones that are somehow capturing the court. When in fact, Democrats, Democrats have all said for years now, but certainly in the last week, after the passing of Justice Ginsburg, that they're gonna pack the court. That's the real capture of the court we need to be concerned about. That's what we need to be focused on stopping. With that, I, uh, I yield back. I next will recognize the gentleman from Calif California, uh, excuse me, from uh, Hawaii, uh, Ted Liu, if he's on. Ted Lou from California, I'm sorry, he's not on. With that, we will move. Hey, Mr. Chairman, could, if, if I could just uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record the uh, piece from the Wall Street Journal yesterday, questions for Senator Whitehouse. As I indicated at the start of the hearing, we were not able to question the senator, so I would ask unanimous consent to enter this uh, piece into the record. Without objection. We'll now uh, go to uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you to the witnesses for being here today. Uh, a few days ago, our nation lost an icon, an amazing pioneer, a legal pioneer, a social justice pioneer, Ju Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, led the way for some of the most fundamental rights for Americans today. And without her, our American judicial system and way of life would be far different. So I extend my deepest condolences to her loved ones and those around the country who are mourning her loss. When our founding fathers established our republic, they were keenly aware of the importance of an independent judiciary, one that does not give in to pressure by outside interests, but instead remains committed to the rule of law and the people it serves. The effectiveness of our laws and the respect given to them by the American people rely on independent, fair decisions from our judiciary. If our judicial system is incapable of doing so, then our democracy and rule of law as we know it are at stake. It's extremely troubling that a 2019 
Quinnipiac poll, University poll found that most Americans believe the Supreme Court is motivated by politics, not by law. Our judicial system works when the American people believe it is fair, independent, and transparent. And I hope we can all agree that our judicial system needs to be independent and free of partisan entanglements that we so often see in other branches of government. One area I wanted to talk about here today was uh, amicus briefs, and amicus briefs filed with the U.S. Supreme Court in particular. Amicus briefs are legal documents filed by non-litigants with strong interests in the subject matter. They are meant to provide relevant information that the court may wish to consider before rendering a decision. However, to file an amicus brief, there is a cost that can range anywhere from 10,000 to 50,000 and above. There are over 500 briefs filed with the Supreme Court every year. That is up to a large sum of money. And right now, there is no disclosure requirements of the funds used to pay for these briefs. Judge Gertner, I'd like to ask you a question in particular. In one high-profile case, uh, this, uh, this coming Supreme Court term, Google versus Oracle, a group called the Internet Accountability Project filed an amicus brief supporting Oracle's position. Um, Bloomberg, Bloomberg subsequently reported that Oracle, one of the parties to the case, had donated between $25,000 and $99,999 to the Internet Accountability Project last year. IAP did not disclose that fact that they had been funded directed by, directly by Oracle, one of the parties to the litigation, and the Supreme Court's rules did not require such disclosure. I want to get your opinion on this. As a general matter, do you think it's appropriate for an amicus to file a brief in a case where it directly receives funding from one of the parties? I have two answers to your question. Um, I think it is a disclosure matter. I think there should be a disclosure. The problem is that with respect to Supreme Court practice, just as with Representative Lofgren's question, this has to be something that the Supreme Court imposes on itself. It's actually can't be something that the Congress imposes uh, on the Supreme Court because of separation of powers issues. But I think you're, I think you're quite right that that, that, that that ought to be disclosed. It really is not the case that the right and the left are equivalent with respect to pressuring the court. Uh, I just want to sort of look at the other answers to other questions here, which was that the left, as, as, as Michael Grieve, who's a Federalist Society member said, on the left, there are a million ways of getting credentials. On the right, there is only one way. And however one characterizes the Federalist Society, it is wrong that it be the way to, to the federal bench, as opposed to other organizations and other funnels that would go to the, that would channel people to the bench. Your Honor, it's I have one, that it, that's a great point. I just have one additional question. I want to make sure I, uh, my time is short. I want to talk about the Judicial Code of Ethics. A judicial Code of Ethics applies to every other federal judge except Supreme Court justices, especially now. What message do you think it sends to the American people that the Supreme Court does not have a code of ethics? And what message would it send if they adopted a code of ethics upon themselves? I think the Supreme Court should adopt a code of ethics. I think we are sufficiently divided. There are these kinds of issues that are uh, challenges to judicial independence that all uh, judges should participate in a judicial code of ethics. The Supreme Court has to, however, impose it on itself. But I think that that's the right thing to do. All right, I have a short time. Any of the other witnesses like to comment on the judicial code of ethics for the Supreme Court? I might say one thing, if I can, uh, Representative, which is that uh, the For the People Act passed last year does call on the Judicial Conference of the United States to draft such a code of ethics. So uh, only the court can impose it on itself in our constitutional system, but we can give them some content for that. And that, I think, would increase the pressure on the court to do so. Maybe the Federalist Society could take this issue up, uh, Mr. Shapiro. I yield the gentleman's back. time has expired. But you may respond, Mr. Shapiro. I'm not a judicial ethics expert, but, and I don't represent the Federalist Society, but um, I'll, I'll do what I can. Thank you. Uh, we will next go to uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to the witnesses for testifying uh, at this afternoon's hearing in light of the recent uh, passing of Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. This hearing is not only uh, timely, but relevant. Uh, according to the Administrative Office of the United States uh, Courts, there are nearly 70 federal court vacancies, uh, mostly for district court appointments uh, that currently sit unfilled. 
Thus far in his administration, the president has successfully appointed over 200 federal judges, including Supreme Court Justice uh, Neil Gorsuch and, of course, Brett Kavanaugh. Uh, that success rate is attributed to the quality of the lawyers and jurists that the president has nominated and that the Senate has confirmed for the federal bench. Uh, and it's that success rate that has drawn criticism about the membership and organizations like the Federalist Society, which was founded on, quote, principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of governmental powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. But somehow, those principles in which it was founded were ignored when the Judicial Conference, the organization that sets policy for the federal judiciary, issued draft advisory opinion number 117, which found that formal affiliation with the Federal Society, whether as a member or in a leadership position, was inconsistent with the Code of Conduct's canons. Um, that same advisory opinion did not raise similar concerns uh, with a similar membership organization, the American Bar uh, Association. Advisory Opinion 117 was drafted uh, despite Canon 4 of the Judicial Code of Conduct, which allows judges to serve as members and officers of nonprofit organizations, quote, devoted to the law, the legal system, or the administration of justice, unquote, which I'd submit is exactly what sort of work uh, the Federal Society undertakes. Um, Mr. Shapiro, I'd like to uh, ask just a, a few questions from you uh, with the time I have remaining. Uh, but at the outset, would, would you agree with the general premise uh, that I've just laid out? I think I can generally agree with that, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now, in your view, is the uh, Federalist Society devoted to the law, uh, the legal system, and the administrative uh, administration of justice as defined in Canon 4 of the Code of Conduct for United States judges? And uh, first of all, would you would you say that's accurate in your view? I haven't studied the judicial canons in depth, but it sounds to me as like it's accurate. Okay, thank you. Um, does the Federal Society take policy positions of any sort? It does not. Does the Federalist uh, Society actively lobby Congress? It does not. Um, could anyone uh, be a member of the Federal Society? Is that accurate? Uh, anyone can. I believe in, in law schools there's a uh, $5 membership fee. Okay, $5. Um, would, you, would you agree that the American Bar Association uh, takes on a more politically active role than the Federalist Society? Yes, and it's not even close. Okay. Um, could you uh, describe briefly how the two associations, the two organizations are, are different, how they differ? Sure. Um, I think I was briefly a member of the uh, ABA out of law school. They gave law students free memberships or, or something like that. But the um, this is not your father's or your grandfather's ABA. Well, Lewis Powell was the president of the ABA. And from that, uh, that was a launching pad for him to join the Supreme Court. Uh, the prestige of the organization has gone down, as has the membership. I forget what the percentage of lawyers in the ABA uh, is now, but it's significantly, significantly lower. Uh, uh, and the ABA does take positions both on amicus briefs and in terms of just organizational corporate positions on various issues of controversy, sometimes even non-legal issues, I, I, I think I recall. Uh, the Federalist Society does none of that. The Federalist Society is purely a membership organization that organizes uh, both social and professional uh, events. Thanks. Thank you. In the short time I've got left, let me just say that you mentioned you were, had been a member of the uh, dues-paying member of the American Bar Association. I was, too, for quite a few years until they came out and took a position on Roe v. Wade uh, against uh, the pro-life position. I happen to be pro-life and felt that I couldn't any longer in good faith pay uh, dues to that organization. So uh, dropped out of the ABA and uh, was better for it. So thank you very much. I yield back my time. Gentleman's time has expired.
Uh, next, uh, the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's been an interesting exercise in fiction. Uh, ever since Bush v. Gore, when the Supreme Court decided to kill the vote in Florida and elect the Republican candidate for president, the court has lost and continues to lose the respect that it once had as an independent body that determined cases by the law instead of by politics. Bush v. Gore was a low point that has continued on in a rather parallel course. And we see now with the Federalist Society having control over who gets on the bench, what we are seeing in the diminution and the destruction of American values. Mr. Shapiro, do you believe in diversity among judges and among government leaders? Um, depends how you define diversity. I don't define it as white men. That's what President Trump has appointed predominantly. And to the Court of Appeals, he's appointed only whites. A few women, not many. Almost all white males, no blacks, no Hispanics. A record that's even worse than, it's worse than any president since Ronald Reagan. He's appointed about 200 judges, and only eight of them have been African American. Only eight have been Hispanic. None, no African Americans to the Court of Appeals. That is despicable, because diversity is an important part of what America is about. Giving people opportunities, giving people, like Clarence Thomas got his opportunity. He hasn't risen to the level of Thurgood Marshall, but he's been on the bench and served Scalia well. People, George Bush understood appointing an African American. Donald Trump doesn't get it, and the Federalist Society apparently doesn't get it either. And they apparently got some problem with Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Unitarians and maybe even Jews. It seems to be predominantly Catholics that they get and they recommend. Catholics are great people. And I almost, I, my brothers went to Catholic schools and I came close to doing it. But they shouldn't have a monopoly on the bench. And to the exclusion of Episcopal, other Protestant religions, and Jewish people. Merrick Garland happened to be Jewish. Ruth Bader Ginsburg happened to be Jewish. Her wish wasn't considered. Merrick Garland's nomination wasn't. And the fantasy that's been put on display here by you, Mr. Shapiro, that there's something okay when the president is of the same party of the Senate to allow a nominee to go through in the last couple of months because the president's of the same party is basically saying that, that there's no basis to believe that the judges are really ruling based on philosophy and the law, but that it's all about politics and we want to get in our team. Because Merrick Garland should have been given a vote. And the, nobody talked back then about, oh, well, the president was of a different party, and that's why the rule exists. No, it was said by McConnell and all of his acolytes that it was that the nomination was in an election year, and we don't do that. And now they're all the hypocrites are turning around. The hair of the hypocrite is so apparent on the Republican Senate and on you, Mr. Shapiro. You mentioned about these judges becoming so controversial and being along party lines. I know you don't have much respect for the American Bar Association. I do. They look into each of the nominees and they rate them as qualified or not qualified. When President Obama nominated people, no person he nominated was considered not qualified. President Trump has nominated nine people who were not qualified, seven of whom were approved by the Republican Senate even though they weren't qualified. And some of those people had allegiances and res respect of Confederate histories and didn't respect Brown versus Board of Education 
and they're white people who don't respect the Brown versus Board of Education and want to repeal Roe v. Wade. What you have done with the Federalist Society is the end of the Supreme Court as we knew it, and you should be embarrassed. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Mr. Biggs from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I'm really uh, kind of disappointed that uh, Senator Whitehouse chose to leave because I had some question I wanted to ask him because um, he's always talking about the dangers of dark money in politics. And I what I would ask him, I would say, do you support your own past comments encouraging dark money in liberal politics? Why is it okay for you, Senator Whitehouse, to accept and encourage support from dark money organizations while at the same time attacking dark money? I'd ask him if he supported Arabella Advisors' efforts to plan for and organize unrest should President Trump be reelected. And moreover, what's just been reported this very day, the, uh, the unrest that they're uh, paying for to attack Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell in the Senate. I'd ask him if he supported Ar Arabella Advisors facilitating a fake news organization as a way to avoid FEC rules, banning micro-targeting by political organizations. I'd ask him a few of those questions. I'd ask him this question. I'd say, you just said, and I'll quote what he said, a well-stocked bench can institute policy when Congress fails to act, close quote. I guess my question would be, isn't that seeking some kind of judicial activism? And Mr. Chairman, I don't know, somebody's got their phone going off or what? I can hear somebody's phone. So I would, ask, I would ask him that, because if you start talking about capturing the court, and, and some of you talking up there that I heard today and Senator Whitehouse, I, I find myself saying, where have you been for the last 40 some odd years? When I first came out of law school, conservative intellectuals, court observers, and writers were talking about what you're calling court capture today, but a liberal activist bent in the federal courts judicial activism. That was what was going on, but that was okay because that's what you wanted. That's what you wanted. The reality is this. Senator, uh, Senator Whitehouse didn't like what happened when the Pacific Legal Foundation took him to, co him to court representing somebody in his district when he was the AG in that state. And I'll tell you one other thing that I've written recently. It's this, you can't forget the Democrats believe the best bet for enacting their policies is a legislatively active Supreme Court. They have promised to pack the court if President Trump gets any more of his nominees on the bench. And as my colleague from Ohio said, what better way to capture the court than to pack it? So when someone says and indicates that that the, that the conservatives are trying to capture the court by advertising, lobbying, and supporting nominees by this president. Where were you four years ago or six years ago when the same thing was going on for liberal judicial activists being nominated by President Obama? And when I hear, let's talk about diversity, how about diversity on the court? How about different judicial philosophies? Well, you don't want that, do you? I would suggest you probably don't want that. And so that's, that becomes a problem. How about when you start talking about not party, and you start talking about procedure and regulation, how important that is to restoring the credibility of courts, how about getting ju jurists that follow the Constitution instead of actively trying to legislate from the bench, who are trying to create law, not interpret law, not apply the law to the case before them. I think of the first case uh, of, of, of seeing this kind of outrageous misconduct towards a judicial nominee. You remember Robert Bork? I watched that hearing. I was practicing, young lawyer at the time. I could not believe I could not believe what was happening. And then the criticisms levied by the, my colleague across the aisle from Tennessee the, about Clarence Thomas. I watched that. That was an unbelievable hearing. 
the ruthless nature of that. But it was all topped by, just a couple years ago, Brett Kavanaugh. So I'll tell you, if you want to see people capture the court, then you need to pull yourselves back out of it as well. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I have some, some documents I'd like to uh, submit for the record. I have got the, the, the letter from James Burling dated September 5, 2018, regarding uh, Senator Whitehouse. I've got an article um, from Fox dated uh, two days ago. Questions from Senator Whitehouse from Washington, uh, uh, Wall Street Journal. Another piece dated from September 22, 19, uh, 2020. Another one. Um, Another one about Sheldon Whitehouse. Another one about White House, uh, Senator Whitehouse blames dark money. Another one called Schumer Tide PAC received $1.7 million from Dark Money Group. Another one called Democrats used to rail against dark money. Now they're better at it than the GOP. Uh, documents reveal massive dark money group boosted Democrats in 2018. Left's point, person for post-election violence prep linked to Arabella advisors. Wealthy donors pour millions into fight over mail-in voting. Newsroom or PAC, liberal group muddies online information wars. Uh, Facebook. Gentleman's time has expired. I know. I'm, I, these are for uh, uh, okay. submission right. to the record. Proceed. And so, thank you. Facebook cracks down on fake news sites, including far-left operation funded by dark money. Network of news sites must register as political committee due to Democratic links, complaint, uh, complaint alleges, and then finally, climate change and dark money. Uh, if they would be admitted, sir. Without objection. Thank you. <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. We'll commence a uh, second round of questions. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, and, uh, and at this time I would like to um, excuse uh, Judge Gertner, who I understand has to depart at 5 p.m. So uh, without objection, uh, you are excused. And thank you for your appearance today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, uh, Professor Hollis Bruski mentioned, I believe it was her in her testimony, that when the U.S. Supreme Court decided the case of Citizens United, it, in a fit of uh, judicial activism, after discarding the, the ropes of uh, originalism and textualism, uh, decided an issue that was not brought before the court, which was whether the uh, whether a corporation had a First Amendment right. Uh, do you agree with uh, her characterization of the uh, Supreme Court's action as judicial activism? And you should unmute. Uh uh, I thought I did. Okay, can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. Okay, we can't hear you now. I'm on, am I? Um, You're popping hold, in hold and on, out. Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'll note while you are uh, struggling to answer my question, my time is, is, uh, is running. It looks like a green light here, Chairman. I don't know what's going on here. Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, and I would like for, for you to answer that question. Sure. Sorry. So, so real quick, uh, uh, activism is an effort thrown around by all parties. Well, well, let me ask uh, the they question. They don't like the opinions. So let, like let me ask the question like this. Let me ask the question like this. In the first, let me ask the question like this, Mr. Shapiro. Was the issue of uh, corporations having a First Amendment right of freedom of speech the issue that was first argued before the U.S. Supreme Court in the Citizens United case? It was not. It was Justice Alito asked uh, the Deputy Solicitor General whether it would be possible to ban a book that was produced using corporate funds. And so when the what, answer was essentially so what, quite possibly, so what, that opened up this larger question. Yeah, well, I mean, so the court ended up deciding a question that was not brought before it by the litigants. Isn't that correct? Yes, on occasion during the course of oral argument or other Supreme Court proceedings, 
other issues arise that the court requires supplemental briefing or even as in this case. But on issues uh, that were originally brought by the parties to the court for decision, that was a fundamental breach of uh, appellate court etiquette. Uh, Do you agree with that, uh, uh, Miss Professor Hollis Bruski? I'm not sure about rules of etiquette, but I can tell you that traditionally that's been one way to define judicial activism is when courts and judges invite questions that were not brief to be brought before them so that they can make decisions they think are appropriate. And so one thing that uh, the Federalist Society is known for is that its members who serve on the bench are generally um, loath to uh, support any regulations of businesses, to support Second Amendment rights, to uh, be in favor of overturning Roe versus Wade, uh, deregulation of business. uh, And they also uh, have a uh, habit of wanting to never take race into account in making decisions. And they generally don't believe in uh, measures that would promote racial balance. Isn't that correct, uh, uh, Mr. Shapiro? There were a lot of statements there. I'd have to take individually. Well, let's take Roe versus Wade, number one. Federalist Society judges uh, are prone to uh, want to uh, overturn Roe versus Wade. Correct? I don't know what's in their heart of hearts. I don't think a single one has had the opportunity yet to rule on the question of whether Roe v. Wade should be overturned. Well, we do know that Roe versus Wade is a litmus test for uh, Federalist Society judicial nominees to uh, be in favor of overturning Roe versus Wade. Isn't that correct? I have not been in meetings in the White House Counsel's Office, so I don't know exactly what's asked, but I highly doubt that that type of litmus question, litmus test question is asked. Professor Hollis Bruski, uh, what is your opinion on that? question. So like Mr. Shapiro, I've not been inside the White House Council and observed anything directly. What I would say is that with the rise of Leonard Leo as the vice president of the Federalist Society, who is very openly anti-abortion, anti-reproductive rights, um, given that he is controlling judicial nominations, one could make some inferences from that. And so I'll go back to the appearance that with Leo in the White House, that that certainly could be a litmus test question. Thank you. And since the clock was running during my time with the technical difficulties, I want to yield uh, a minute to my friend and colleague from the state of Texas, Sheila Jackson Lee. Let me thank the chairman very much and the ranking member as well for their courtesies. I'm a guest on this subcommittee. I'm a senior member on the Judiciary Committee. I was reading the definition of the Federalist Society that indicated their textualist and originalist interpretation of the Constitution. I hold this book, and it is well known that the Constitution uh, has been viewed and it is most effective as a living, breathing document uh, to ensure um, that uh, all of the nuances of America are protected under the law. I don't believe uh, we had any need to lobby this present administration because the White House counsel that he had at the very early stages was very engaged with the Federalist Society. So rather than lobby, they simply had to pick up the phone and call or simply had to submit a list. Uh, Let me ask uh, Amanda, Professor Hollis Brevsky, and thank you so very much. Um, What happens when you have a court Uh, that is skewed uh, specifically on a political basis. And as someone who was in uh, in Florida doing 2000, actually counting chads, uh, and because of the Secretary of State Republican, the Governor Republican, uh, our counting was actually cut off. Uh, When the two uh, parties went to, and I say parties, principals, went to the Supreme Court, it was a 5-4 political decision. And that decision was also contrary to the vote. Can you just give the downside of what happens when a 
uh, court is so skewed one way or the other as it relates to justice? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, I'll give two answers. One from Alexander Hamilton's famous essay on the judiciary, Federalist 78. We know that the judiciary has no power to enforce its own decisions, and its only real power is the power to persuade the public that its decisions are well-reasoned and legitimate, not grounded in politics, not grounded in partisan politics. And so any decision that has the appearance or the valence of partisan politics is problematic for judicial independence and for judicial legitimacy. Political science corroborates this. A wealth of political science research shows that the single greatest threat to judicial legitimacy is the perception that a Supreme Court is acting on politics, that it is politicized, not an independent arbiter of the law. And so I'd give you an, an answer from Hamilton and an answer from political science, but they're basically the same. Legitimacy suffers. My, my reclaiming my time, Yield which back. has Thank expired, uh, I will now turn to the gentleman, uh, to the gentle lady from Alabama for her five minutes. I thank the chairman and I yield to the gentleman from Ohio. I thank the gentle lady for yielding. Um, Professor Hollis Bruski, is it appropriate for Democrats to impeach the president for following the law? I'm, I'm not a lawyer or constitutional lawyer myself, but impeachment is a political process and it's always been a political choice. So you think it's a, you think what the speaker suggested on Sunday uh, on one of the Sunday talk shows that the president, following what the Constitution requires, naming or, and, and putting up a nominee for a court vacancy, you think it's appropriate for the speaker to and the Democrats to move ahead with impeachment for that reason? Uh, that's not what I said. What I said is well, no, but I that's, that's what I'm asking. Is that it's a political process? Um, I don't. I'm not taking a position on what is and what is not an impeachable offense. I don't feel qualified to answer that. Well, there's, there can't be an impeachable offense because he's doing what the Constitution says. So I'm just asking if doing what the Constitution says, nominating an individual for the Supreme Court now that there's a vacancy, and the speaker said she was open to, use, to, to impeaching the president to stop that nominee from being confirmed in the Senate, I'm just asking you if that's appropriate. What I'll say about that comes from my understanding of comparative democratic norms and how democracies die, which is we are in a process where parties are escalating against one another. And according to the political science, that is how democracies die, when you abandon mutual toleration from the, for the other party and respect, and if you don't engage in forbearance, which is restraint of one's power to respect the spirit of the constitutional system. And so what I'm hearing from you sounds a lot to me like another level of escalation uh, that we've been engaged with between these two parties. Is over packing the, the court, court escalation? I would, I think, I think Levitsky and Ziblatt in How Democracies Die would call this constitutional hardball. And I think, yes, they would characterize it as another escalation. Yeah, it's, it's been the norm for 150 years and they're gonna, they're gonna put six new justices, take it from nine to 15. They've been very clear about that. That is, that is the biggest escalation you could talk about. Uh, you earlier said that the Federalist Society's actions and conservatives' actions, quote, have, have led uh, people to lose, excuse me, lose faith in the rule of law. Do, would Americans lose faith in the rule of law if the Democrats proceeded with impeachment based solely on the fact they're trying to slow up the president's constitutional duty to name someone to the court? And would Americans lose faith in the rule of law if the Democrats pack the court? Was that a question for me, Congressman? Yep. Okay. Um, again, I'd take a step back here and say it doesn't matter where this behavior started if we end in mutually assured destruction. And so what I'm seeing happening is uh, escalation. And I believe that the president putting a nominee through this close to the election will be understood also as escalation given what happened with the Garland nomination. And so, yes, I think that Court packing would be the next step in escalation, and were the Republicans to take back power, they may expand the court again or engage in jurisdiction stripping. This is exactly so the you, kind of behavior is, is that it, I, is they it, talk about. Are you, are you opposed to the Democrats' court packing uh, pl plan? I haven't read the plan. I'm, I'm listening to reports of it today, and... Oh, it's a simple, I, I'm, it's I'm a simple question, Professor. The Democrats want to add six people to the court. Are you for that or against it?
I'm so, sorry. It would have to depend on what happens over the course of the next month and what, and what the Republicans do. So if the Republicans follow the Constitution, the president names a nominee and the Senate does what it's supposed to do, have hearings and confirm or, or deny that nominee, we'll, we'll have to see what happens. But if they follow the Constitution, somehow that's the equivalent of, th that's escalating, that's following the law, that's following the Constitution. But when the Democrats add six to the, to the court, that's, that's okay. Is that what you're saying? All I'll say is that according to Levitsky and Ziblatt, the only way to get out of this vicious cycle of escalation is for the party in power, and that right now is the Republicans, to engage in forbearance, which is intentional restraint of one's power to respect the spirit of the broader constitutional system. To yeah, take I think the, the spirit, I think the spirit that should be respected is what, is what the American people elected the president to do and elected the Republican Senate to do, and that's put conservatives on the court, and, and all we're doing is following the Constitution to do that. Mr. Ginsburg, do you agree with the Democrats' plan to pack the court? I would distinguish between expanding the number of members of the court and packing it. That is, uh, the number is... Well, you, you think know, they're going to put conservatives on the court? I could imagine a bipartisan uh, uh, agreement. Uh, You're that crazy. Would the there balance. is no way that's going to happen. They're going to add, so they're going to add six new people to the court and they're going to make three, they're going to put three, three liberals and three conservatives in your dreams. I would like to see, I would like to see a restoration of the filibuster rule, which would require that kind of bipartisan cooperation. That's how we get out. Well, they've of said they're getting rid of that too, Mr. Ginsburg. Chuck Schumer's already Ginsburg. said, Senator Schumer said he's getting rid of the filibuster. This has been uh, an escalation. You guys are, you, you guys are know. living in a dream world because that is not where they're at. They've said they're going to impeach the president for following the law. They're going to pack the court. They're going to get rid of the filibuster and a whole host of other crazy things that go right at the structure. And somehow you guys come here and blame Republicans for the concern. I, I, I think the American people see through that. They see what the Democrats are trying to do, change fundamental institutions, fundamental structures in our government. And you're saying, oh, it's going to be warm and fuzzy and bipartisan. There is no way with what they're threatening, what they're pressuring, what they're saying, no way that's going to happen. I say it should be bipartisan, Mr. Jordan. Would adding six new justices cause people to lose faith? Same question I asked Professor Hollis Bruski. Mr. Ginsburg, would that cause Americans to lose faith in our rule of law? I think uh, the question, again, is who are they and how is it done? And I don't think that just adding justices on its own uh, is fundamentally going to cause people to lose faith. If it's part of this process of partisan escalation, then yes. And that's why I would like to well, see so the actual restoration. I would of disagree the with answer. that. Adding adding six new people to the court, that's like saying, oh, we don't like what's happening, so we're gonna change the rules. We're gonna we're gonna say that 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 now we get to the, the court's fifteen. I don't see how that that strengthens our institutions well, or helps in any way. Is packing the court capturing the court? Seems a term that Mr. Whitehouse used that some of you have used in your statements. Capturing the court. It seems to me the, the best, the, 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 the most obvious capturing of the court is when you, you say, we're going to change the rules. We're going to add six of our folks to it. We'll capture it that way. Is packing the court capturing the court, Mr. Ginsburg? One, one way to capture a court is to control its personnel and to, take, uh, to establish a dominant. It's the easiest way. Maybe the court. easiest way. Yeah. Change, yeah. change so the, the rules. Way. We'll, we'll change the rules so we get control of the court. We're not going to follow the rules. We're not going to let the American people decide through elections who gets elected, who gets to nominate, because we lost elections, but now we won one, so we're going to add, we're going to add six new people to the court. That is not fair, and the American people understand it. It was tried once. Thank goodness it didn't happen, and I hope it doesn't happen. I hope it never happens. I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, next up is the gentle lady from California, Mrs. Lofgren, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, it's interesting to listen to uh, the latest exchange because <laughs> there are some assumptions that are unwarranted. Um, it's as if that uh, if uh, Mr. McConnell succeeds in jamming through uh, a confirmation within either after the pres presidential election or before, that somehow that is going to result in an expansion of the court. No one has said that. Certainly, Mr. Biden has not said that. But I think the real issue is following the rules and being fair is important for the preservation of our democracy. And we've seen, in my view, this administration has repeatedly violated 
norms and in some cases statutes um, because they can and in pursuit of power. And there are some things that are more important than power and keeping power. And that's the preservation of our, our democratic republic. You know, I, there have been plenty of times when I've been on the losing side of an election, the person I was backing didn't win. But you don't do everything. You don't violate rules and norms. You don't jeopardize confidence in the democracy just to keep power. That way leads to the end of this beautiful experiment in our democracy. So I, I would just like to say, I think it's important, the gentleman from Ohio, the ranking member, is talking about you know, following the rules. The rule was set, uh, and there's a little creative spinning of it now, but members of the Senate, when Mr. Gar uh, the last Obama nomination, that we would not do a confirmation in an election year. And in fact, it used to be called the Biden rule. Uh, they quoted the Biden rule, that that has been kind of the standard that people accepted. Now, because apparently the president must assume he's going to lose the election, um, there's a rush to not live within that norm that had been established to try and grab power at the expense of the confidence that the country has in the court. We know from polling that a majority of the American people now believe the court is political. And that's both Republicans and Democrats believe that the court has become a political animal. That is very dangerous for our country. And I think it's important that we think of ways that we, each of us, can pull back from our corners and see how we can take steps to, to build confidence in the institutions of our government, in the institutions of our society to preserve this democracy. Now, I'm going to get to a quick question, if I can. The, gen the other gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, talked about the um, code of conduct that was then withdrawn. And I thought it was interesting that it didn't, the rule didn't say that you couldn't accept uh, uh, you know, trips. It just said you couldn't be a member of the association. I am wondering, uh, Professor Ginsburg, whether you think that it undercuts confidence in among people to see members of the Supreme Court accepting lodging, travel, meals paid by the Federalist Society or others, any, any uh, ideological group that might have an interest in the outcome of decisions. And shouldn't we, um, and actually couldn't the, co the Congress, set some standards and requirements for the Supreme Court to actually disclose information and benefits that they receive. I'm uh, a big believer in the idea that sunshine is the best disinfectant. So I think disclosure is important, and uh, I think it can be done, and certainly the code of ethics that's been uh, proposed uh, to be passed by the Judicial Conference for the Supreme Court could be adopted by the Supreme Court. They could adopt a code tomorrow. And I don't see why they don't. And I think that uh, really just making the public more aware of this issue, I think, would put some pressure on them to do so. It's not like I think that they're engaged in nefarious activity, but the public has a right to know if we have a lot of power at the court. I'm not saying it's nefarious, but the perception is important. What we're talking about now is the confidence of the American people in the institutions of their government, legislative, judicial, and executive. I see my time has expired, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, and uh, we will now have five minutes from the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein. I thank the chairman, and I want to thank the gentlelady for her remarks. Um, I, I know she has been an, an advocate for uh, preservations of, of the rules and the norms of not only this committee, but of, of uh, our system of uh, our uh, republic. And um, 
and working for my predecessor, Congressman Goodlatte, when he was uh, alongside the gentlelady from California. Uh, I think there was a, a bipartisanship there. Often they would put aside partisan differences to work uh, to preserve those norms. Um, I, you know, the, the preservation of the Democratic Republic rests in part on, on the restoration of confidence in this institution. Uh, when this institution devolves into, into partisan power plays, uh, I, I think there is a uh, whatever results, whether it's uh, appointments to the court or, uh, or uh, impeachments of, of the president, uh, if they are not done for reasons that are um, legitimate, then it, it does reduce the confidence of the people in this institution and in their entire system. So to restore that confidence, I agree, we must respect the norms uh, of, of American society and American governance. And, and those include uh, maintaining a nine-person court. Those include respecting the Article III advise and consent uh, role of the Senate, uh, decision to appoint and confirm Article III judges. Um, under Article One and um, restoration and respect for the filibuster rule, I think, is a norm that over time has become part of the system, and that has been abandoned for uh, partisan political reasons. Uh, you know, the gentlelady mentions actions in pursuit of power, and and uh, I would argue that uh, the expansion of the court to name justices of one party or another or that lean one direction or another would be a an action in pursuit of power and uh, if you question that all you really have to do is flip it on its head and say if the current president sought to do the same thing and sought legislation currently to expand by six justices the Supreme Court and name six additional justices right now uh, that would be viewed by uh, my colleagues on the other side is a an action in pursuit of power and uh, I, I think that uh, therefore you must view what the minority in the Senate is currently proposing uh, as as equally uh, based in the pursuit of power so uh, I, I long for a return to these norms a respect for these norms that's the respect that I have for this committee it's why I got on this committee um, and and so I, I hope to contribute to that as a member of the committee, and I will say the gentlelady also spoke um, about accountability on the court and about transparency on the court. Transparency is something I'm very uh, interested in when it comes to the federal government, and uh, I've, I've co-sponsored a bill with a gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, uh, called the Judicial Travel Accountability Act that requires a, a judicial officer to annually disclose uh, the source, description, and value of certain gifts a detailed description of meetings and events attended, including the names of other known attendees and total expenses for transportation, lodging, and meals. Uh, that bill, I believe, is in this committee. Uh, I would love to see it moved forward in a bipartisan way. And, and so um, to further encourage that norm of transparency, which has developed over time, and restore confidence in the institution of, of government, in the institution of the courts, and in this institution. So with that, Mr. Chairman, um, I don't have any other questions, and I will yield back. Gentleman yields back, and with that, we uh, will conclude this hearing. I want to thank the witnesses for uh, their testimony. Any, um, let's see. You'll bear with me one second. If there's any, any uh, need to uh, supplement the record in any way, uh, it will remain open for. All members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witnesses or additional materials for the record. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.